it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the long-awaited um, Tarana Burke. Uh, she is... She is the founder of the Me Too movement. She is the woman that many, many years ago decided that this was an issue that needed to be talked about, that many, many survivors um, could uh, break the isolation and sense of, of, of shame by hearing from others about Me Too. She um, is a very busy woman these days, we know, um, in high demand, and so we are so pleased to have her join us here and share her words of wisdom and inspiration about what we do now and what um, has happened with Me Too. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Tarana Burke to join here. Thank you. You've been around a lot when you run into your favorite ASL folks. <laughs> oh man, Whew, we finally here. I'm so glad to be here. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Sister Annabella. That was thank you for sharing that story. I'm so appreciative of you and your work. Um, oh, we lost our our Office of Violence Against Women folks, huh? I was gonna say a bold move would be making sure we extend the Violence Against Women Act, so. <laughs> since we didn't get around to mentioning that. Pass that on to your colleague. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about what I was gonna say to this group for a long time. <laughs> I spent the greater part of the last 10 months crisscrossing uh, um, across the country, trying to help people understand what the Me Too movement is all about, right? Um, talking about our vision of, for interrupting sexual violence and what that actually can look like. And I've talked endlessly about censoring survivors and bringing folks from the margins to the center. But this is a different group. And yeah, you all are different. And in many ways, we already share that vision. We share the same vision and we're a part of the same movement. So I don't have to really explain those things here, which feels good, by the way. <laughs> So I went back and forth about this until about two days ago. This is also procrastination, but we're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> but a woman, I was in Vegas since Monday for another conference and a woman stopped me and she worked for the Las Vegas Rape Crisis Center. Y'all here? Anybody from Vegas? Hi. <laughs> I don't know if she's here or not, but she stopped me to say that she appreciated my work and she added, um, I really don't know how you do this work at this level, but I figure if you can keep going, so can I. And so we laughed a little bit and went our separate ways, but it really made me think because I haven't had a lot of time to stop and think. We really underestimate the value of just taking time to sit with yourself, right? And so I did. I took a little bit of time to think about how, <laughs> how I've been doing what I've been doing for the last year. And the things that I came up with, I think, um, were really helpful for me. I needed to take some stock and take a step back. And so I decided to share those. I decided to um, share what I came up with in case it might be helpful for some folks in this room, uh, especially as we continue to make bold moves to end sexual violence. See, I got it in there. <laughs> <laughs> My friend and colleague, uh, Joanne Smith, who's the founder and executive director of Girls for Gender Equity, Oh, shout out to Joanne, it's okay. She always says uh, we come to the work because we are the work. And I think that, isn't that so profound? I think that's such a profound thing um, to keep in focus. So these are the things I came up with. The first one was um, find your tribe, right? And keep them close. This work is hard. That goes without saying. It's hard and it's easy to get lost in it. I was fortunate enough to have identified my tribe a long time ago. Uh, I got an airtight click, as they say. And I trust them implicitly. Without them, this year would have swallowed me whole. They hold me accountable. They keep me sane. They keep me inspired. They make me curious. 
and they keep me grounded. It's so easy to get caught up in our singular contributions, but ultimately that's a hindrance to progress. The lift is always more than we expected, and part of the problem is folks trying to be singular heroes instead of Avengers. <laughs> I fully, I fully recognize that the work that we started with Me Too falls along a long line, falls along a long continuum of work in the movement to end sexual violence. And we couldn't have done this or come this far without friends and allies. This work is best done in community, so it's important to find like-minded folks who have a similar vision for a way forward to build with and commiserate with and to win with. So that's my first thing. The second one is keep my instinct sharp. So how many of y'all, how many times have you asked folks for advice and they say, follow your instincts? <laughs> I always feel, I mean, it's not bad, but I always feel like it's the advice people give when they don't actually have an answer, right? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, follow your instincts. <laughs> but what few people will tell you is how to keep your instincts sharp. Just saying follow your instincts assumes that your instincts will never fail you. And that's not true. Anything that functions better when it's sharp needs to be sharpened. Human beings, particularly those of us who have committed ourselves to reversing injustice, have a tendency to develop absolutes in our views of the world. But one way I try to keep sharp instincts is to challenge what I know, what I think I know to be absolutely true. One great way I've done that is by mixing up who I have in my community. And that's not to be mistaken with my airtight click, that's different. This is a community, which is broader than that. And I've, and I've made sure to have some folks around who have different points of view and alternative visions for justice and safety in the world. And I keep them close and practice active, deep listening. When I, Sujatha taught me that. Where's Sujatha? Active, deep listening. <laughs> when engaging with them, try it. You will either expand your own vision or have a better understanding of why your vision is sound. But either way, it allows that muscle that controls our instincts to expand and contract, which will keep them sharp. Okay, the third one is to regularly re-examine my motives. And this is hard for us sometimes, right? Because we, we so self-righteous. <laughs> we are, y'all know we are, we can, we can be that way. I am doing the right thing. I'm on the right side of justice. You probably are, <laughs> but this goes right along with sharpening your instincts. Passion and instincts can either take you far or stunt your growth. And that reality is in direct relation to how honest you're willing to be with yourself. This is not to be mistaken with second guessing yourself though. But the nature of this work is service. We've chosen a life to be committed to be in service of other humans in the world in some capacity. The people who we work in service of are often in critical need. So an inability to, without ego, examine ourselves and ask tough questions is a disservice to those people. We have to ask questions like, why am I here? Am I the best person to provide this service? Am I using my privilege in service of those with less than me? What is driving my investment in this work? This is also where that tribe can come in handy if you pick the right ones. Ask for honest feedback and then gift yourself with the same honesty. At the end of all of this self-examination, you may draw the same conclusions, that you are where you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to do. But I guarantee that your approach to the work will improve and your output would be more excellent every time. I'm still learning <laughs> and growing and listening and serving, but this is a unique historical moment that we have. We have a unique opportunity to advance our work in ways that many of us couldn't even envision before last year. I will be trying to follow my own advice daily, and I hope it's helpful to y'all, some of you. And I hope some of you will share what works for you with me. <laughs> Cause trust me, I need it. We have a big job to do. Um, I'm so humbled and grateful to do it in community with you all, but we do have a big job to do. And it feels sometimes like it gets bigger every day. We are consumed every day in the media, well, not consumed, but we are definitely partially consumed by 
all of this news about what's happening in the world under the umbrella of the Me Too movement, right? They stuff everything under the Me Too movement nowadays. <laughs> everything, right. Y'all would not believe, you probably would believe how my phone rings. I'm like, I stopped doing, you notice I stopped doing all them little MSNBC, CNN hits for everything. I'm like, I feel the same way I did the last time some knucklehead did something. Stop asking me the same question. It's annoying. But just because they don't have vision doesn't mean that we don't have to, right? We're in a, mo a moment right now where I know we never thought this would happen, but the work that we do has been elevated and also invisibilized at the same thing. Isn't that incredible? I find that incredible every day. The reason why I wanted to share these tips is because I feel like we are family. This is my tribe. We are all kind of on the same path and nobody really is out here undergirding us, right? There's a lot of talk about a lot of things and a lot of us are survivors too. And even those of us who aren't survivors are so committed to this. We are up to our, over our heads, committed to this work, and nobody's undergirding us. And so we have to take a minute to step back. I really just wanted to talk to us. I wanted to talk to y'all. Y'all know the work. Y'all have the commitment. You would not have traveled to this conference room to eat this food that you're going to eat while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the food is going to be good, no. <laughs> but you know, no, we wouldn't be up every day doing what we're doing, making what we make. Okay? We wouldn't be doing that if we weren't committed to this work. And I'm, you know, I, I, I also fully recognize some sister when I came, when we came to my table and we were talking about the up and down of, of being in the spotlight. It is, um, I'm under no delusion about what this is at all. But while I got it, I'm gonna run with it until they realize they gave it to the wrong person. <laughs> Every day I, real, I think I'm gonna wake up and somebody's gonna be like, wait a minute. Why did we give her a microphone? <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Free the people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not gonna take up much more of your time. I, I did before I end wanna take a moment to acknowledge this day, um, August 29th, early on the morning of August 29th, 2005. A storm hit the Gulf Coast, affecting the shores of Alabama and Mississippi and most crucially, New Orleans. And uh, Hurricane Katrina was a very, pivotal moment in my life for so many reasons. I lived in Alabama at the time. I had very close family, shout out to Alabama. My daughter was who was born in Alabama, when people try to make fun of her says, I put the bam in Alabama. <laughs> but I was living in Alabama and I had very close friends and relatives in New Orleans at the time and so um, I would be remiss not to acknowledge it. But also, there's a poet named Sunny Patterson, a lot of you may have heard of her. She wrote a beautiful poem in honor of those who, sur who um, survived hurricane, hurricane Katrina. And I love it so much. Y'all, a lot of you've probably heard it. It's really popular and she did it on deaf, com deaf poetry. Um, I love it because of the acknowledgement of Hurricane Katrina, but also because I think some of the words apply to all survivors. And so in memory of Katrina and in honor of all of us serving and moving forward, I just want to share this little snippet from her poem. The end of her poem, she says, which path will we choose? Either we win or lose, cause death doesn't come in vain. Not for us to remain enslaved or our spirits to remain in cages. It comes for us to be courageous, to fill our obligation to our God of all creation and stand in determination, able to look death in the face and say, we made it, we made it, we made it. Thank you. Yeah.